Hey there, my name is René Zolman and this video is going to be a little different. Usually I script my videos, which means I put a lot of work into researching specific topics. I then write a script and then I record the video with a teleprompter in my little, um, yeah, let's just call it a studio. But one of the biggest bottlenecks of producing my investing content in such a way is the editing. It takes a lot of work. Setting everything up in the studio also is quite time consuming. And I figured I want to add a new format to my channel in which I more casually talk about investing without any fancy editing and so on and so forth. Yeah, and I hope you enjoy this format. It's a little outside my comfort zone because I have to speak more freely. Um, as my regular viewers will know, I'm from Germany, so I'm not a native speaker. I'm relatively confident in my English skills, obviously. I even teach English at school. But still, um, don't be surprised if I'm maybe not as on point as I am in my regular videos. So for this first video, I've decided to record a little Q&A. And I've asked the community if they have any questions. And a few people have actually reached out and shared a couple of questions. And I will just briefly talk about my thoughts on these topics. So let's have a look. Question number one was, if you have 2.4 shares of a stock, do you get dividends for two shares or 2.4 shares? Well, that's actually a pretty straightforward question. I would say you can basically just Google it. Um, personally, I don't know. I don't own any fractional shares in any company. Uh, so I had to look it up and apparently, yeah, obviously you will receive um, a proportional payment of the dividend once the dividend uh, arrives in your portfolio. Moving on to the next question, which is, I know that bonds should protect your wealth if you invest in quality aristocrats stocks. If a market crash happens, shouldn't your dividend amount stay the same, even though share prices go down? And if that's the case, why invest in bonds in the first place? Mm, that's an interesting question because here we have to talk about different asset classes. And I've actually recently started working with a group of students who I teach basic personal finance, but also quite advanced investing concepts. And in one of our previous sessions, or last or more recent sessions, uh, we talked about asset allocation. And in this context, we of course also discussed the pros and cons of all sorts of different asset classes. And um, I referenced Jeff Gannon from the Focus Compounding podcast. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, uh, but Jeff, Jeff, however you pronounce his name, um, he's incredibly smart. And he once said that if you have a very long-term investing horizon, um, basically putting any money into an asset other than stocks, you're going to lose money uh, because stocks historically have just delivered the best returns. So that's kind of one part of my answer to that question. And then my, one might also point out, well, what is actually a dividend? A dividend is paid out by the profit that a company generates. And of course, there can be a market crash, which would lead to broad price declines in individual securities. But depending on the business, the overall decline in prices might not have any impact on the fundamentals and the uh, profit generation capabilities of that particular business. So of course, uh, you shouldn't be worried about the decline in prices. In fact, the dividend yield will go up, which means if you would purchase the stock today at a lower price, you would receive much more in dividends relative to the price you have paid. All right, next up, is fundamental based investing not an exercise in hubris? What makes you think that you can do better valuing a company than anyone else? And secondly, others will align with your thinking in a reasonable time frame. Again, super interesting question. I think in a way it addresses, obviously it addresses two issues. Uh, one is the common question that every once in a while comes up, is value investing that? Because people do not try to value stocks, so businesses um, on fundamentals anymore. And I have to say that very clearly, value investing is never going to die. Of course, I think that is something that I've addressed in a recent video of mine. At the end of the day, if the majority of market participants is not going to focus on the fundamentals of the business anymore, you have to rely even more on the management of the companies you own to make sure they realize the value. It's actually quite simple. Um, let's say a company is trading at five times its free cash flow. 
basically if the company is not growing and it would pay out all of its profits to shareholders, this means you have a guaranteed 20% return. And if, if management is competent enough and thinks paying out the profits to shareholders to give them a 20% return is the best use of capital, that's great. If they have internal reinvestments, uh, reinvestment opportunities that might produce an even higher return, of course, they could reinvest the money instead of paying it out to you. Or they could just buy back the stock at five times free cash flow, which would also yield quite quite a market beating return. So all I'm saying here is that if the market ignores the true value of a stock you own, you own, um, then you have to rely even more on the management realizing that value. Now, the first part of the question um, kind of addresses the topic of overconfidence. Um, most active investors fail beating the market. That's just a fact. Um, I was today, this morning, on a call with someone and I shared an in interesting chart from JP Morgan, uh, which I've also shared in previous videos of mine. And I guess I'll just show it on screen right now again, which compares the return of different asset classes. And I'm not too familiar with the methodology they have used for, um, yeah, to arrive at these numbers. Um, but apparently the average investor is underperforming broader stock markets and uh, also other asset classes by a wide margin. And that's mainly because they might be overconfident. They uh, don't control their emotions, they, or I should say, they act emotionally. And to a large extent, that's also because they lack the required knowledge when it comes to understanding businesses, but also valuing businesses. And I'm fully aware of the fact that I might be overconfident too. Um, what might give me confidence is that I've performed quite well so far. Um, if I look back at the historical performance of my portfolio, I am reaching the seven year mark when it comes to um, my investing performance. And uh, I have to say that the last, I don't know, let's say nine to 10 months have been uh, very pleasing for me personally in my portfolio. Uh, late 2021 and 2022 have been a little harsh. And um, so I've caught up quite nicely with my portfolio. And all I'm trying to say here is that my Historical performance gives me confidence in terms of me being able to outperform the market going forward. Okay, I'll do a couple more questions, but there are more than I can cover in this video, I think. So the next one is, can you kindly review fast graphs and interview Chuck Carn Carnival? Um, what's quite funny is like when I first saw that question pop up on YouTube, I had no idea what fast graphs is. Um, in fact, I thought it might be a publicly traded company. But for some reason, the uh, YouTube algorithm then showed me a video and I just looked it up beforehand. And uh, obviously this video was by Chuck Carnival, who apparently developed this tool. I haven't taken a closer look at the tool itself. Um, at first glance, it seemed like you know, just a regular um, platform that is providing financial data. Um, I'm usually using Stratosphere, Coifin and Ticker and at first glance I, I would say that Fastgraph seems to be doing the same thing but I don't really know. Um, I don't really have an, an informed opinion on it. Um, I would have to take a look at Chuck Carnival as part of uh, producing new types of videos as I suggested in the beginning, beginning of the video. Um, I have thought about interviewing people. I think I've asked you so the community uh, what do you what do you think of it beforehand so yeah i might i might actually consider that next question how do you justify nvidia's or tesla's stock price well if you have watched some of my past videos you will know that i will have a hard time justifying um, the stock price of nvidia and tesla if you think about potential investments to make in terms of opportunity cost i think there are much easier bets to make in the current environment, like much, much easier bets. If I had to justify their current prices, well, the main variables to look at, or maybe I should say the main variable to look at is growth. Um, you can basically create a reverse valuation model, and then you can just play around with the metrics like growth, profitability, um, future multiples the company might be trading at, to figure out what has to go right for the stock price to make any sense um, right now. 
Okay, I'll do one last one and let me know if you like the format. There are a bunch of more questions which I could address in a future video if you enjoy this video. Uh, quite frankly, I don't think this video is going to perform well. But I'll do one more question. So what do you think of gold as an asset? Uh, we have talked about assets at the beginning of the video, right? We talked about bonds. Um, I think gold is an overrated asset. Um, once you truly understand the distinction between productive assets, so those are assets that actually produce cold hard cash and non-productive assets, which gold is part of that group, um, I think you will be a fundamentally better investor because asset allocation or the decisions you make in the realm of asset allocation might be some of the most important decisions you will ever make as an investor. So if you put gold in a safe and 10 years later you take it out again, it will be the same. It will not have grown. So if you think about that, about it, I think it only makes sense that over the very long term, gold will at best perform in line with inflation. It's not going to outperform um, any productive assets. It's a speculative asset in nature. If you would tell me a bar of gold costs $500, I would say, okay, that's fine. If you would tell me it's $500,000, that's fine. And if it, would, if it would be worth $5 million, I would have no idea how I could prove you wrong um, because it's a non-productive asset. So I hope that answers that question. And um, as I said, let me know how you liked that format. I'll wrap it up here for today and I'll see you in future videos. Take care.